just as a starting point, I, I, I wanted to say thank you to, to Paul Campbell and all the IB organizing committee for having me here, but particularly for organizing this carnival of ideas exchange. So please give them an applause. When I came to the airport from here, I remembered that I came here once to New Orleans about 20 years ago almost. It was a trip that I made with my father. We came from my country, Chile, and it was a very special moment because I had not really traveled outside of Chile, which is a South American country. It was very pretty. I was very much pleased with it. The only thing is, what I can't, uh, the, the, we were going to leave, the Mardi Gras was beginning, so I felt bad. So that's like going to Rio de Janeiro and you leave the day the carnival's going to start. That's crazy. So I'm trying to forget that, but I still can't forget that, really. Today, my day has changed. In the last seven months, I've visited 11 countries to work in education themes, and I think that's symptomatic of the world in which we're living in now and the generations that we're forming. This, uh, live, this is a representation, this room, of the world that we live in. I would like to compress it and to see how these divisions between countries are becoming accelerated, broken down, and making a synthesis. What I'm going to present today is something like uh, a, a snapshot of a mosaic of tendencies that I would like to show you some elements that are fundamental so that we can see the education of the 21st century. And I'm going to show you some presentations that are kind of crazy, but I'm going to try to do it. And we're going to talk about the obsession that we have, education within education, visuals, and also invite you the, to think the idea of new forms of learning and unlearning certain moments and certain spaces and think, rethinking about the decisions that we have today and think about tomorrow, the forecasting, that these things are relevant for this world in with regard to transformations that are being carried out. Another element that I should like to uh, talk about is the idea, the concept of digital fluidity. fluidity. This goes beyond the dominion of one technology or another, and it has to do with the different ways of reconceptualizing knowledge. Another element which I'm going to refer to today, the limits which we are restricted by or that we protect knowledge. Sometimes I think that we need less copyrights and more rights to copy, especially when we talk about excesses. I love the introduction which she talked about that. Also, I would also like to talk about creativity. I'm convinced that creativity is one of the things that are most fundamental for the 21st century. And we talked a lot about creativity, but that implies adopting certain ideas that are radically different from a lot of practices that traditionally we see in the formal education. This takes us to think about new schemes of certification, of recognizing and visibility of knowledge within and without. And also, and I know this is strange to say this in this type of presentation, that also it's a good idea at some times to unplug yourself. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later more deeply, but maybe on the screens, let's see if we can see this. Charles Sellard made this analysis of the relationship between a dichotomy between the development of education and development of technolo technology. He addresses that there's a disparity at moments and approximations. There's a case that we know well, someone you know well. Let's see if we can in introduce him here. Under the logic of this vision, sometimes we have that moment when there's a big 
technological development and it's not paired up with uh, strategies of learning and, and teaching that would be coherent. This generates a moment of, of an adjustment a social an adjustment when that process reverts itself when learning can go beyond technology is when we talk about prosperity today it seems like we are in one of these uh, crossroads where we are permanently listening uh, in different media este discurso lo escuchamos todo el día, ¿no? Permanentemente, especialmente. We listen to this all day, especially those of us involved in technology. This doesn't end here. This combination, this of tendencies that were found and then lost, takes us to listen to this type of thing. This is a profound crit crit critique of the educational system that cannot re respond to the needs. The important thing is that this is not a new speech. This is the disparity between society and education. This doesn't start just today or yesterday. Let's see if you remember this person. Do you know him? The world is moving at a tremendous rate. No one knows what. We must prepare our children not for the world of the past, not for our world, but for their world, the world of the future. Llevamos por lo menos. We have been for 70 years in this speech of preparing for education. I think sometimes we want to think so much of the future, we don't entertain the present. It's not only John Dewey. At the beginning of the 80s, during, during Reagan's uh, government, uh, this article was published, Nation at Risk, that uh, addresses the dis difference with the economy in transition and the competencies and abilities uh, that we prepare our future generations. It talks about three elements that are interesting, technology, robotic, and laser. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, there was an influence of Star Wars in that speech. But the interesting thing, this existed already, this reflection that it was important to think about a new set of, a, of skills that could be more in accordance to the transformations of the world that looked at that time even big. This, invest, this research is very well known, de developed by Lady Moren. It's a longitudinal uh, study in the 1960s to the beginning of the 2000s, where there is a decrease in the demand. Uh, and there's an increase in activities that are more analytic. It's interesting because it gives us a snapshot of high speed of the changes we are living through that are not too difficult to identify. This uh, stops uh, at 2000, but we can see the United Kingdom where there's a increasing demand for those skills that are uh, higher and more complex and a decrease in those skills that are more functional or easily replaceable by technology. We could ask ourselves, in which measure, how can you see this from the perspective of the, of the work uh, world, working world? We see it like this. We did a study where we wanted to find out what type of skills are demanded by companies today in those skills that are not the, the skills that are functional, which are easily measurable, but those 
skills that are more of a social nature, more soft, more difficult to measure, just like you, what you see on the right, the uh, ability to communicate, to be creative, to, to have a contextual development. And it's interesting to see that in organizations that could be more tech technical, like uh, World Bank or the OPEC, uh, we see that there is a great demand for those softer um, skills. There could be many technical companies. They have to have like the uh, a programmer that needs that know that language that is difficult. They must have uh, an enormous set of skills. This is not the end of the story, uh, but we are adding another facet the explosion of the internet in, in in its beginnings it was only concentrated in a few countries and now it has grown grown exponentially not only through broadband but phone uh, mobile phones but this goes hand in hand with what he suggests that the the world has become flat the not only companies are exporting countries are exporting People are exploited. We live in an economy of talents, and those that flow through the market are people. How are we preparing these people so that they can manage in diff such different contexts, like people such as you in this room? This takes us to think, to get closer to a different way of learning. It takes us to thinking of combination of different contexts and spaces and rethinking the doses of information uh, that we must learn. I'm going to show an example. You know, I got through it anyhow, so it's, you know, it wasn't, I was not a great fit, or the system was not a great fit for me. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, that we take all these children and we force them to try to adapt to this really complex bureaucracy, this, this system. The system should adapt to them. There's a very big difference between access to information and school. They used to be the same thing. Information is there online to anyone. Connectivity is actually opening up the world. Educate a youth and you educate a nation. Knowing, knowing something is probably an obsolete idea. You don't actually need to know anything. You can find out at the point when you need to know it. La última persona que habla es... The last person was Subhata Mitra, who was, became famous when he did the research of holding the world in India, when he was uh, researching how children use technology. But he says something that's very provocative. We could stay here all day. He says, to know, to know is something obsolete because you have access to the knowledge. I don't defend his theory, but I think it's a provocation, it's a reason to start warming up. Another interesting thing is this process of deep transition in which we are. If we can combine the variables that are formal, informal, individual, collective, we go from a practice of individual learning and in the left quadrant could be the classroom, an essay, a reading, an examination, to practices that not only offer more possibilities for learning, but also informal uh, learning in a collective way, and that's one of the best contributions that internet can offer, the possibility of building knowledge and architecture of participation that could get uh, cause values that are much richer than individuality. That is the value of Wikipedia, free software, and all this movement that exists beside, behind MOOCs, for example, the possibility that many people can learn with other many people. This it's easy to uh, to present it, but it's di more difficult to implement it. Flipped learning, I think, on a really basic level, is taking what has traditionally been given in a lecture in terms of direct instruction and shifting that out of the class time, and then using that recuperated time more wisely, more valuably, to really meet the individual learning needs of students. 
the way I got started doing this is I just started recording my lessons live for my students who were missing class and posting those online for them as a resource. They get to access it when they want to, and that could be at 10 o'clock at night, it could be 6 o'clock in the morning, it could be on the bus to, work, to the soccer game. Um, they have control of that. Students would watch those before they came to class, and the class time was work time, engaging in some, uh, some higher order thinking, and we, so we didn't have to use our class time for direct instruction, we could shift that out of the class. Yo imagino que algunos de ustedes han escuchado esta idea del aula volteada. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the uh, reverse classroom. He, he says something interesting, to give the student the possibility to manage his spaces of learning, give the student, empower them the to the possibility of when they learn. And the interesting thing is to convert the classroom into a lab in a space of exchange between many people and not waste that moment only to teach a magisterial class. Along those lines, this implies to rethinking the schemes of pedagogy. I don't think there is one system of pedagogy. There may be a com there should be a combination. Here we have the eutagogy. Um, is the idea of encourage to the maximum the type of auto determinant. Uh, learning. It's, it's been done for adults, but today this process of learning, it's a nego permanent negotiation between my experience and the problems that I have to solve every day. I believe that the evaluations that the OP is, um, is suggesting go directly in that direction with more emphasis on the tacit learning and another type of learning which I will explain. Now, in order for this to function, it has to be fluent. And it has to do it in a way where technology makes it easier and that we do do it more, the technology be more and more invisible. And what is more visible is the exchange of knowledge. In order for that to happen, we have, much, have to have much creativity in, nine, in the year. 1899, John Marco Ted imagined how the future school would be, and he drew it up there. And at the bottom is a school that's, that resembles the schools of today. I don't know about you, but for me, this man had a very impressive image of the future where we are not as creative as, as we think we are as far as in, uh, incorporating technology. 25 years later, or 24, Professor Michael Pubin imagined, had another vision that is aligned by John Marcotte. He imagined the, the education of the future where, with the beginning of the radio, a, a professor could uh, transmit his classroom and other people on the other side of the Atlantic could be listening to this. It's very pretty, but it it looks very much like what we're doing with MOOCs or distance uh, learning. I think we can do much more than these people. What these people imagine uh, a century ago. In this great enthusiasm that exists as, as far as the value of technology in learning, there is an enormous pool of technologies and devices that play an important and basic uh, role, but also an enormous amount of uh, tools and devices. But then we see the problem of convergency. Let's see some uh, examples. Emma. 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 <laughs> That's not technology, but the way in which we use it is important. 
and the European Union, there's a research program every three years or four years to see how they're using incorporating technology into the classroom. This is a very important study because it's longitudinal. You can make comparisons. And here I'm going to show two ideas of the more recent one. The main conclusion, which is a little bit deceiving, is that you need more technology. Well, I say that's not very good because, well, a lot of times, for example, the book written in 1901, oversold and underused book, there are two conclusions which are more important in this research. The first one is that they say the students are using technology in a more frequent manner at home than in school. And that has a direct correlation with its confidence in the skills that they have. Hybridation of contacts. And the second element is an enormous need that teachers can develop greater measures of confidence and skills in using technologies. And this implies not taking courses all your life, but it implies creating a an approximation, more systemic approximation. In other words, where there's more spaces of microtransference of knowledge amongst colleagues and equals or peers and transformation of more informal knowledge. In fact, in schools and between different locations, this is interesting because it breaks the logic that you have to take a lot of courses, you have to think more in a process of collaboration between peers. I'm going to give you an example that seems very important, and that suggests this project, which is called educationpoint.sky.com. And here they invite schools, even though in very different parts of the world, to offer spaces for transference between peers. Between peers, you're going to transfer knowledge, let's see. and I started looking and after seriously one minute, I found a teacher who was also looking for somebody to do a web project with, um, which was awesome. So I um, connected with her right away and then I also put on um, my profile that I was looking for other teachers to do a weather project with. And that same day, I got five teachers who were interested um, all over the world. El principal valor de las tecnologías es el valor so this is the social value that this is generating, not the amount of information that they can hand in. It's the social value. This means the possibility of constructing with others. And we talked about the architecture of participation. That's the main element. When Philippe Cousteau talked about the 60s or the heroes, and, you know, I could think of that, but we think we have to transfer our superpowers amongst ourselves. We don't need a super teacher, let's say, or super material. So that this works, as Rosenthal talks about, you have to talk about the idea of literacy, digital literacy. There's a series of competent skills using technologies. And, of course, this doesn't have to do just with the apparatus and devices but not just the Trojan horses. The interesting thing is the cultural exchange and the way which we use these and how we use uh, knowledge. I'm going to talk about this digital fluency. What it means is to be able to create and to share and to build, to redistribute, to enrich, to amplify, to connect, et cetera, et cetera. It's much more complex, much more diverse, and also, let's say, than just the fact of administering or managing a certain type of software. With this beautiful image from a Mexican library, I want to give you some data about the fluency, digital fluency. The first one is datum about Eric Schmidt in 2010. He said that in the entire human history, history they had five exabytes of information. Today, that information is generated every two days. Another datum. Cisco, Cisco says that the projections that they have for 2015, they say that we are going to see, we're going to have generated so much information as a tower of books, let's say like this, to Pluto, the planet, but 20 times as much. So, as teachers, how can we 
give knowledge in this world that's just uh, invaded by data, how can we give valuable information? That's a big challenge for us. Hello, uh, just after semi-skimmed milk. Your search for semi-skimmed milk returned zero results. We don't sell milk. Your search for milk returned 52,256 results. Your top hit, milk of magnesia. No. Milk flows of yesteryear. No. This milk being family wall planner. No, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for, you know, normal milk. Couldn't find what you're looking for. That's what I'm saying. I can find it, so I'm asking you if you can... Advance, sir. Oh, all right. Let's do this. You what? No. Oh. Uh, yeah, OK. Milk. Please narrow your search by using one of the following filters. Kayak. Packet 12. Shelf cleaning. Breakfast in condom. That one. Breakfast. One result. Milk. Skim semi. Semi skim milk. That's what I first asked you for. It's milk skim semi. En ese mundo tenemos que movernos. In that world, we can see that there's no such thing, but there's a level of complexity that we have to resolve. Paul Hister wrote in 1997 that the skills, digital skills, have to do with the dominion of ideas and not the keyboard. So this is very profound because it talks about converting knowledge into something invisible and giving valuable to amplify knowledge that we can generate and construct through that. Technology. And it's right and proper, therefore, that we should build them into the heart of education. But it's also important we do it because the tools themselves uh, are creating cultural changes and possibilities, which are really quite new. Our students are connected not just with the people in the room around them, but with literally anybody on the planet they care to be connected to. And that's an entirely new cultural proposition, I think, and it changes the game. And my argument is that one of the reasons we have to transform education, and we really do, is because the technologies have changed the whole context of education. But they're also among the ways in which the transformation itself will take place. So this shift to me is much more than uh, a shift in the way we do art or the way we do design, although that's certainly the case. These tools are extraordinary. They affect the way we think in all disciplines. They affect the way we think of disciplines. They affect the way disciplines interact. So these new tools seem to me to be providing opportunities and a palette of possibilities which should be available to every single student, not just to a few. Sirken Robinson, muy conocido por su chat. Robinson, who's very well known for his talks, and they talk about... I, I mean, he's talking about two things that are very fundamental. The possibility of looking at context, that's fundamental and the possibility of combining disciplines, which is also tr fundamental and not easy to implement. So let's think about a technology that we're talking about combining contexts. Will that exist? It will exist in the future. It's difficult to think about that, but let's make an exercise here. Google Glass, me imagino muchos de ustedes lo han escuchado. I imagine a lot of you have heard about Glass. It's very interesting. How to think in learning practices that are in agreement with a new technological era that are more portable. And we can have them in our watch and our eyeglasses. And I think that's going to have to do with technology where the next generations are going to use this to connect themselves. And the idea of, let's say, different contexts and also combined disciplines. Now, 
So that this combination exists, we also have to think about frontiers that are more versatile, more flexible, more permeable, how we access and share knowledge. So we, I talked about uh, not just copyrights, but the right to copy and set some points. That has to do with not a dichotomy, but a combination. There's a principle in Japanese, which is wabi-sabi, which poses the idea, three fundamental realities. One, nothing lasts forever, nothing is completely finished, and nothing's perfect. Everything is improvable. I think this applies very precisely to knowledge. We don't lose knowledge when we share it. The question is how to generate spaces, contexts that allow sharing this knowledge in the best way. This has to do with being able to access sources, whether it's a code, it could also be a database, it should be a research project. It has to do with allowing copying the context and content. It has to also have to modify the content and also the possibility of distributing the content. These are four liberties that are fundamental and essential so that the exchange of knowledge occurs. I'm going to give you an example and I'm going to present to you Mr. Joseph Gall. Well, it's not him, but he's a primatologist. He in researches how primates function and live in community. He directs a Max Planck Institute in Germany. And he says that one of the big differences between apes and people, the people are monkeys, we have knowledge of previous uh, generations and we build on that, human beings, but the primates can't learn and even though they transfer knowledge and DNA, their learning has to be through each uh, species, each being in that species. And so that's, I like this a lot, what he says. Today, there's not one person who's capable of creating a simple pencil. To produce a pencil, you have to combine the knowledge of a lot of people. Under that logic, therefore, science also works like that. Science works based upon sharing knowledge with others. You copy it, the quotation in science works under the possibility which is more flexibility for the methods that we use to share knowledge. So therefore, it's fundamental that a teacher from the 21st century understands what the great commons and different ways of sharing knowledge. And this results essential for a university or a universe of knowledge itself. There's a platform, not everyone knows it, but I'm putting it here if you want it. It says search.org. You can ac access a lot of information there on the internet, open knowledge. You can uh, see videos, text, content, other people who seeded their rights so that you can look at it. It's an open system. And students have to know this. It's fundamental. It's also legal on the internet, but they also understand the importance of sharing. Japanese have a phrase. It's a little bit uh, strange, but their phrase from the Japanese says that knowledge and love is the only thing that you don't lose when you share. And I think that's very, very uh, in agreement with what we're talking about today with regard to education. Let's see an example of resources, educational resources, open educational resources. Let's see an example. Climate change course reaching about 100 students per semester. One day he thought, if I could upload this course online, then not only would my 100 students have access to it, but others as well. So he did. And this is what happened. Anna sent the course's content across the country to Alex, who was studying climate change. Alex found it so interesting that he forwarded a copy to his friend Lulu in Africa. Lulu was developing peer-to-peer -peer courses with Philip. So they remixed the content with other resources and created a new course about the impacts of climate change in Africa. Al, a participant in the course, shared the content with Gabby, who was studying environmental policy in Latin America. Gabby brought the content to her class, and together they translated it into Spanish. After the bueno, el círculo virtuoso continúa. The virtual circle continues. This is a video 
there was a campaign to the uh, U.S. Department of Education that is called Why Education Modules. It, it invites you to think about open ecology and the enormous potential that it has as far as inclusion and access. When knowledge is open, when there is digital fluency, there are great possibilities to stimulate and develop this fundamental ability of uh, the 21st century, which is creativity. I like to understand creativity as the ability to use imagination to transcend traditional uh, rules, patterns, etc. But we must have in mind that creativity also includes a strong component of chaos complexity, confusion, and that means that creativity not only applies to artists and designers, but it also applies in each area of human knowledge. But in order to be creativity, there has to be a fundamental element. Uh, there, It has to welcome mistakes. We have to learn to systematize it and learn from failure. That means enrich yourself from previous experiences. The mistakes should not be punished in school, but it must be encouraged because it's part of learning. Now we're going to see some techniques to stimulate creativity. How many sing in the shower? Few, few of you. You have to do it more. I sing terribly, so I don't do it. You can see the video. It's on the internet. I'm not going to show it all. But all these actions that we have presented demand to be able to adapt more vers versatile strategies. Andreas Lacher from the OCD, OCDE, uh, says that in the past, we looked at schools in terms of formal qualification. But today, qualifications say very little about the skills that people do have. So the thing is, we must think in more versatile, more flexible um, systems. Uh, I, uh, the flippable classroom here, Sophia offers an open uh, course of medals so that the uh, teachers can incorporate this in, in the classroom. This is not a traditional approach. This is not um, a project from Sophia. It, there's DY. Dot org invites the students to participate in a bank of experts where they share their knowledge and others learn from them. When you learn, you get a medal. What sense of, to get a medal? In the virtual world, medals tell us the flight hours that we have learning. I have to give you an example that is growing a lot, was impel, propelled by the uh, generator of Firefox. It's called Open Badges. An online way to showcase what you can do in and outside of school. So if you want to do blogging outside of school, then you can get a little badge online that you can put on different sites to show your achievements. There. Good thing to have on, say, a CV, or if you're looking for any extra responsibility within the school and within the wider community. I really think it would help motivate students in the future to achieve more, not just in the curriculum, but also outside of school in the wider world. Bueno, si los si los chicos pasan muchas horas en las redes sociales, ese es el if children spend too, uh, a lot of time in social media, you must show these medals. These don't go against the uh, traditional awards. It's a compliment to it, but it's related to the, in uh, the exchange offered by internet. Do you remember the 29 ways of be creative? I believe I want to go back to one, and it's not singing. La numero cuatro. Ah, 
Eso no sé si le gustó tanto. Pensar. I don't know if you like that. Think of disconnecting yourself for a while, sometimes. You remember when people was able to talk without asking in Wikipedia the definition? Remember when people was not afraid to fly with, without Google Map or a GPS? You remember those years? I suspect that sometimes we get too far into this. In the world of today, In the, today's world, it seems we have changed our priorities. Before, we could go to the bathroom or on a plane without having to be connected. Now we cannot do that. That is why I believe that we must also, that it is also important within digital activities to know how to disconnect. I'm not against technology, you must realize that, but I am in favor of a strategic use of technology. And this sometimes means not to be afraid to be face to face. This, this is an image that many of you have seen when they were waiting at the Vatican to elect a new pope. This is an image from 2013 when Pope Francis was elected. Something happened in this society that we cannot live anymore disconnected. That is why when we get data like this that presented by the telephonic uh, or organization uh, saying, asking how much is internet use, there is an average of six hours at, at the world level. It's 42 hours a week, 2016 hours a year. It's like three months out of a year exclusively connected. If we take the hours of sleep, we still have very little time offline. That's why we have movements of unplugging. Even partially, don't be afraid to speak to someone without Wikipedia next to you. I'm going to show you something else. A theory that has recently been developed to address the intake of too much data due to the widespread use of digital devices, massive amounts of new information, and the ability to transmit this information so quickly. What's truly fascinating is that Americans spend half their year consuming information. That's 182 and a half days of straight data consumption. If I break it down, the average person consumes information for 12 hours a day, taking in 100,000 words a day which is 201 letter-sized pages of text, single-spaced. The scariest part is that when only read, we remember 10% of this information. The stats on the internet seem decent, with the average person spending 32 hours online a month. During the same time, 30 billion new pieces of content are published on Facebook. That's three with 10 zeros. In terms of emails, the average professional receives at least 100 emails a day. No wonder why Yahoo's survey found that one-third of people would rather clean their toilets and sort through their inboxes. Vamos a ver. ¿Qué, qué hacer? Let's see. What do we do? Where do we go? What is the suggestion? For starters, it means we've become digital junkies. But the real question is, how do we fix this? We need to learn how to limit ourselves. We need to turn off our cell phones, our laptops, our iPods, even if it's just for an hour. We need to read books. We need to embrace the time it takes to complete a singular task. We need to go outside and enjoy nature. Essentially, I think we need to unplug. Yo los quiero invitar. Muchas gracias. Los quiero invitar a que hagamos una reflexión sobre. I want to invite you to reflect about this. It's not with or without technology. The complex question is, what is the intelligent use of technology? I want to present the last video talking about this.
Vai sim. Oh, tegen ons er. Ja. Insecten. Dat lief. Ik voel twee insecten op je, op je rug. Kan dat? Ja, klinders. Slovenie, Slovenie. Zo, hè. De ene motto, oranje. Pas erop. Zenit. Oui, oui, bien. Je hebt een vriendin, uh, Julie de... <laughs> ja. Een boeiend liefdesleven. Drie, vier... Zo. We vierden daar zwaai ik meestal over, dus dat weten niet veel mensen. Hoe is mijn spiersgeur? Maison rouge, balcon, plan. Ja. Ik zie geld, ik zie transacties. Maar kent je rekening niet meer van buiten? Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Je staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? 9, 7. Last month, mm-hmm. you spent 200 euro's on alcohol. Vorige maand... 300 euro aan kleding gespendeerd. 8, 5 ja. voor een huis dat van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 275.000 euro. Ja, maar eigenlijk. 41. Ja. Is dat juist? Ja, dat is juist. If I were you, I wouldn't laugh so much. There are professors from Berkeley have the 10 principles of pri- privacy. I'm not going to read them all, but they ex- ex- say that digital footprint is bigger than we think. There's no complete anonymity. Communication never is between two people. The networks are always open to misinterpretation. The network, the the web never forgets. An identity is not guaranteed. I don't say this for any other reason than open reflection and and talk and think about the use of technology. I want to end with some reflections and, and conclusions. The first reflection has to do with Nowadays, learning, lifelong learning, has is the new norm. It has to be a transversal, horizontal um, norm. Lifelong learning should be the spine of how we understand learning. Second, the exponential group in information demands a more dynamic approach, more strategic to learning. Knowledge in networks are is always changing and also the possibility of how we interpret it. There is no correlation so far between incorporating technology and the learning outcome. But it has to do with the way we use it and it leads us to thinking in this concept that I feel is basic, a digital maturity. It doesn't mean to always be online, but to be sensitive to the digital print, privacy, and the value of unplugging. I think it's also basic to say 100% blended. It means moving toward a combination of experiences learning, formal learning, informal, collective and individual, learning of one discipline and interdisciplinary. It's a challenge, but I think it has to do with characteristics of internet in this actual, in the present ecosystem. Um, We hear about these skills to survive, the ability to filter, to be open, to share and to connect and to connect. I think it has to do with the essence on what direction do we have to go. Democratization of knowledge is occurring through uh, digital media, and it will be that teachers are not the only one source of truth. And to rethink the way 
knowledge is constructed and reconstructed and updated more than thinking what skills we need. There's a lot of work about that. We have to think of typologies of skills to be able to develop new ways of thinking, new ways of building tools, new ways of working in a changing world. None of this will be valuable if we don't develop more versatile mechanism for accreditation and evaluation of our knowledge. You can download this presentation from this direct, but I want to end saying perhaps we cannot predict the future, but we can build a future that has a space for all of us. Please remember to take your headsets to the tables and please don't leave them on the chairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pluto Cristobal. I'm going to invite you to the exhibition room for coffee and we're going to begin with the first session at 11.15. Please return the receivers uh, when you leave to the tables. Thank you very much. We'll see you later.